how to plug an email in here. Uh, a conversation with Rabbi David Meyer, which we've entitled, A Rabbi Encounters the Catholic Church, a conversation with the first rabbi professor at the Gregoriana. Rabbi Meyer flew in to uh, see us tonight from his home in Brussels, Belgium. But lest there be any confusion, he's a French and Israeli citizen who has studied and worked many years in England and currently commutes to teach in Rome when he's not occasionally flying to China or somewhere else to teach. <laughs> Uh, Rabbi Meyer was ordained in July of 1997, having studied scripture, philosophy, theology, and Jewish history and literature at the Leo Baker College in London, England. After ordination, he became rabbi for the Beth Hillel Synagogue in Brussels, Belgium, as well as teaching uh, current events, uh, Judaism and current events, at a secondary school. At that time, uh, he also began lecturing for the, uh, pardon my French, Centre Biotechnien Juif d'Information, or CEJI, a European based organization which promotes cultural, multicultural understanding in Europe and Jewish culture. Then from 2001 to 2006, he led the Brighton and Hove Reform Synagogue in Brighton, England, while at the same time serving as a chaplain to a university, a hospital, a mental hospital, an airport, and a prison. And began to teach in his spare time. <laughs> uh, since March 2006, he's taught courses at many universities, including the Catholic University of Louvain, the Free University of Brussels, and Nanjing University in China. And since 2010, that list has included uh, the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome, a world-renowned seminary known to his students as the Greg. And he's also written numerous <coughs> articles in both French and English and published four books, that for, yeah. all of which have French titles I won't attempt to pronounce. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but, you know, a couple of them, one was Jewish and Christian Reflections on Universal Values and Social Bonds, um, and another was an examination of three Jewish thinkers on the questions raised by the Holocaust, the Shoah. So Rabbi Meyer will testify tomorrow before the U.S. Congress, uh, before the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe, also known as the Helsinki Commission, as part of a panel on anti-Semitism, a growing threat to all faiths. And that panel will also include the president of the Catholic University of America, John Garvey. So this event grew out of um, an observation that Rabbi Meyer made to a friend of ours, um, Dr. Mark Milos, that piqued our interest. There's a certain paradox in cur current Jewish and Catholic dialogue. In the wake of the Shoah, the Holocaust, many Jews are questioning their, co their people's covenant with God. Yet at the same time, after Vatican II, the Catholic Church is vigorously affirming the enduring value of this covenant. And this asymmetry <coughs> can be seen as an it, as an occasion to just talk past one another, but it can also be an opportunity to learn from one another if we engage in a realistic dialogue. So Rabbi Meyer has fiercely engaged in these kind of dialogues in many settings, but we asked him to speak especially to us about his experience as a professor at the Greg, where he's educating future Catholic priests, church officials, theologians, in courses such as covenant theology, Jewish medieval commentaries, and Jewish theologies of the Shoah and their impact on Jewish Christian dialogue. So we're eager to hear uh, your judgments about what you've learned from these encounters and what we can learn from them. And after the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John, thanks for, for those very kind words. Thank you for, for having me and for being present uh, here to, tonight. Uh, I will indeed try to uh, to speak on the encounter somehow that I feel I'm extremely lucky to have uh, being a professor at the uh, at the Pontifical University in, uh, in Rome, um, and then obviously uh, as uh, John said to leave time for for the questions uh, <coughs> after. Um, I think there's one point that maybe is important. It's important to start with. Is just to. Uh, clarify and to remember that 
I'm not the first Jewish teacher at the Greg. I mean, the Gregorian has had an history of having uh, teaching, first of all, about Judaism, uh, but also teaching by Jewish professors. Uh, and whether it is professors, obviously, from the US, or professors coming through some exchange <coughs> program with the University of Jerusalem, for example, they do have some Israeli professors coming. I mean, they do have that sort of a, of a counter. So I can certainly not claim to be the first Jewish professor there. But I think, though, uh, I am probably the first rabbi who is uh, officially a professor there. And I would say, in fact, maybe more than officially, because officially never really means that much. But maybe most importantly for me is being a professor who is really part of the walls of the Greg, in the sense that when you uh, go and teach, and when I go and teach in an institution like this one, uh, the question is not just having a class, teaching some students who are all priests or doing uh, their master or a doctorate or, or, or any other uh, uh, additional uh, level of education, but the question is also of being part of the place, meeting, meeting with the students, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, uh, at the equivalent to Starbucks at the Gregorian, which is not as varied, I suppose, uh, or outside, but having that sort of a counter that enables a sort of a relationship. And I can see in the experience that I've had over the last uh, four years now, in fact, that yes, I do teach in the class, but in a way, I also do teach outside of the class because I have a lot of the students coming from all over the world and including, for me, from countries where the relationships are not particularly easy because I do have, as John said, the double uh, dual nationality. I also carry an Israeli passport. So to be in touch with people from Iraq or from Syria or other uh, is also part of a very interesting experience. I think from that point of view, I am, uh, in a way, probably the first one to be really part of those, of those roles of, uh, of the Gregorian. Now, I think what is important to say, uh, <coughs> apart from being the first or not, is to actually take the measure of really what it means. Because I think it really means a lot to be able to, to teach there. It means a lot. It's a real break from a tradition of relationship between Judaism and Christianity, which have been, to say the least, very tense over the last many uh, centuries. <coughs> so with that history in mind, to be able to be there really means something quite, uh, quite important. And it means something important both for the church, but also for Judaism. It means something important for the church because who could have believed really, with all the centuries of problem, tension, and even on many occasions, negative teaching of the church towards Judaism, which we all know about. There's absolutely no point in hiding from history. History is what it is, and we have to face it. Who could have imagined that within a period of 50 years, because the real dialogue between Judaism and Christianity really started, I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but really started in 1947, even though there were some elements before, but the crux of the matter started in 1947, that within that short period of time, it would become totally acceptable for them to have someone like me teaching, and not just being there, but also grading <coughs> their students. You know, it's one thing to teach. It's another thing to grade the students, or eventually to fail them. Which <laughs> I'm not no, no, but it's, it's you know it, it, it is a detail which in a way is not a detail, because it's not as obvious as that, given the nature of the relationship. So clearly, for the church, it is quite quite uh, uh, amazing in a way to have that uh, that situation. And I always think that it is also totally amazing, and I say that in a very personal way, and I apologize for that, but. For someone like me, with the European background that I have, each time I step into that building, I cannot avoid thinking of saying, 
two generations ago for my grandparents to think that they could have in the family someone who could feel comfortable, friendly, almost at home in a setting like this one is unthinkable. From the point of view of Judaism, the church was over many centuries the place not to go, the place not to be, not to look at, because there was a sign of danger. There was a sign of, really, you have to be careful. The relationship was in such a state that that was the reality. So each time I go there, I have that feeling that it is really quite an historical moment, in fact, to be able, in such a short period of time, to have been able to overcome uh, that, uh, that situation. And uh, I am, as I said at the beginning, extremely uh, grateful in a way and very honored, in fact, to be in a position like this one. I think it's important to, to really take the measure of that situation, even though it's expressed in, uh, in uh, emotional terms and not in very uh, rigorous uh, terms. Now, all this, uh, I suppose, translates the way Judaism and Christianity have moved. We've moved from wherever we were standing, looking at each other, and in many ways ignoring each other, to a situation when we recognized that there were some changes that needed to be implemented in the relationship that, that we could have. And this is, this is really what happened. Now I would like to maybe uh, slightly temper a little bit that optimism that feeling of optimism that I may uh, have expressed up to now. Uh, because I think there is one point that is a bit unsettling, but I do need to mention almost as, a, as an introduction. And it's a difficult one to say for me because it puts me in a, in a position where I feel a little bit retracted somehow. Um, I think the reality <coughs> is that in terms of the level of relationship between Judaism and Christianity, uh, the church today is much ahead of Judaism. And in a way, it hurts a little bit for me to say that, but I believe that when we have a, a dialogue, and a dialogue in trust, somehow with trust, then we need to be honest with the reality that we face. And I think this is part of the reality, because if I can be a rabbi at the Greg, um, I don't think there are many Catholic priests who are studying in yeshivas or who are studying and teaching in rabbinic seminaries. I had priests and imams coming to teach us about Christianity and about Islam when I was in the seminary, uh, the <coughs> seminary in, in London. But that was on a one-up sort of basis. They were coming in and out from time to time. We were just having a certain number of classes because we needed to know and to have a little bit of a, a wider exposure to other religion and not just about Judaism. But to my knowledge, we don't have an institution of absolute Jewish learning. There is nothing equivalent to the Greg in Judaism because of the difference of structure between Christianity and Judaism, but nevertheless, it's not tomorrow that you will see a priest, a Catholic priest, coming and teaching, for example, at Jews College. Um, and that, I think, is something that needs to be taken into account because it actually shows that from that point of view, the church is a little bit ahead and from that point of view, probably has a lot to teach and a lot to teach us in Judaism in particular. Now, I know that, of course, that could be the result, and in a way it is the result, of the fact that we don't come to the dialogue with the same background and with the same history. And to avoid that point would be really to lack, uh, I think, intellectual honesty. Uh, we don't have the same background to that dialogue because through the prism of history, at least, the violence that was done was usually done by the church towards Judaism and not vice versa. And so clearly, the need to rethink the relationship came more on one side than from the other side. That I can understand uh, that, uh, that reality. I think there's another reality, which is this time not an historical reality, but maybe a theological reality, 
which is that Christianity is based at its origin at least on Jewish thinking and Jewish experience and Jewish books and Jewish references and therefore it needs Judaism to understand itself and this is one of the things of course, that is done at the Greg is to bring back the teaching of Judaism so that the church can understand itself better as well which of course lacks a parallel in Judaism the parallel is obviously not the same I mean many are the Jewish thinkers who consider that Judaism can live by itself and for itself without any reference to Christianity and to a large extent that is true so there is a disequilibrium there's a disequilibrium in the relationship which could explain of course why uh, the church today has moved faster in repairing the relationship with Judaism that maybe Judaism has moved in trying to rethink the relationship it has with with the church but nevertheless I think that thing needs to be uh, to be clarified because again it's a an open dialogue and a dialogue with honesty <coughs> I think those those things should uh, should be should be said now after those uh, words of brief introduction if you want um, I tell you what I would like to do within the, uh, the limited time that, that I have um, I'd like to divide my presentation if you want in three uh, small sections the first one is I'd like to go over how it started uh, and how I ended up somehow teaching uh, at the Gregorian. Uh, the second one is I want to pick up on the point that John has mentioned which is this theological background to the dialogue which makes a sort of a paradox of a situation regarding the covenant. Uh, that dialogue is taking place at a time where the Jewish understanding of the covenant and the church understanding of the Jewish covenant are crossing each other. And that is quite a unique experience of thinking in, uh, in, in the history of our relationship. So I'll go uh, speak over that, and then I would like to spend a little bit of time at the end as well on uh, taking up some more personal issues uh, that I've seen, that I've experienced while teaching at the Gregorian, uh, and trying to uh, mention them, not just because sometimes it's an anecdote, uh, but also because maybe they, they are revealing of some of the beauty of that exercise and sometimes some of the difficulty of the exercise of being a, a rabbi teaching in that, uh, in that setting. So those are the three uh, elements that I would like to, uh, to talk about. And of course, we will leave the time for the question, and if, as I go along the presentation, I mean, if there are terms that I might use and forget to explain and you're not familiar with, I mean, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me, I and mean, that really is not a, not a problem. So let's, uh, let's start and see somehow how it started and how, <coughs> it, how it got there. Um, before I tell you how I got there, though, uh, I think it's important to quickly go back through one or two or three historical moments because it comes as a process somehow. I mean, we, we all talk about, particularly this year, uh, the Second Vatican Council, it's the anniversary year. Uh, we talk about Nostraitate as the document, and uh, we uh, see, we tend to see that document and that council as the moment where the relationship between the church and Judaism started to uh, uh, be thought anew and creating a new reality. But I think we shouldn't forget <coughs> that there was one very important <coughs> moment that happened about 20 years before the Second Vatican Council, and that's the Conference of Selisberg. <laughs> the Conference of Selisberg in 1947, which really was just, just after the war, uh, which was a very, very important moment for the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, because it's the first time, really, where church leaders came and presented what they saw as their responsibility in the Holocaust. Now, of course, it is not, and nobody has ever said that it's a direct, that it was a direct responsibility. Uh, everybody knows that the Nazi were everything but Christians. There's absolutely no question about that. It was not a Christian movement in any way. Um, but nevertheless, what is equally true though, and this is what the church 